Evening everyone and welcome to The Next Revolution. We are pro-worker, pro-family, pro-community and especially pro-America. As we said last week, the heavy-handed Mar-a-Lago raid was a prime example of an out-of-control federal bureaucracy focused on protecting the ruling establishment and punishing those who challenge it. But does anyone think that the FBI, the Justice Department, these are the only parts of the federal government captured by the establishment, totally unaccountable, failing the American people? Just as we're apparently not allowed to criticize the FBI anymore, as if we live in some kind of tin pot police state, the Democrats and their media servants are now telling us we can't criticize another part of the federal bureaucracy. The IRS, the agency they just voted to double in size, which makes you think, what are they hiding? Turns out quite a lot. Here are just some of the findings from recent performance audits of the IRS. 17 million unprocessed tax returns. Nearly a third of earned income tax credit payments last year were, quote, improper. Nearly a third of education tax credits were improper. 13% of enhanced child tax credit, over $5 billion. The IRS sent out nearly 100,000 threat letters demanding tax payments, even though none would you? A scheme they claimed would bring in $9 billion from the rich, cost over half a billion dollars to implement, but actually produced just $14 million in revenue. So the bureaucratic geniuses at the IRS spent 41 times as much as they raised, and what they raised was 642 times less than what they promised. It goes on. In a scheme to target, quote, high earners, it turned out that nearly three quarters, 73 percent, actually targeted working Americans below the threshold. So much for their latest promise to only target those earning over 400,000. We know from their own record that's total BS. The only thing the IRS seems to be good at is terrorizing taxpayers. The audits found the IRS improperly using sneaky schemes to confiscate, quote, principal residences, yeah, your home, and seizing property before even conducting interviews, with, quote, most of the IRS's victims being small businesses who'd committed no crime, but of course they never got their property back. And these are the people that pathetic Biden and his Democrats in Congress have just given $80 billion to hire another 87,000 busybody bureaucrats, doubling the workforce so they can waste even more of your money, abuse even more of their authority to go after even more innocent, hardworking Americans. What a scandal. What it shows is that in the swamp, in the federal bureaucracy, failure isn't punished, it's rewarded. Look at the Labor Department. We just learned that nearly $100 billion in COVID relief money they handed out was stolen. Yeah, $100 billion with a B. That is your money. They took it from you in taxes and then handed it out to criminals. And before anyone says, oh, it was the pandemic, it was an emergency, they just had to get the money out the door quickly. No, this wasn't for vaccines or treatments or anything actually to do with the virus. It was to compensate people for the government's totally stupid, unjustified, counterproductive lockdowns. Speaking of which, Rochelle Walensky, head of the CDC, was praised this week for her honesty in admitting the CDC failed during the pandemic. Honesty? Did anyone actually read what she said? She witted on about the website not being good enough, reorganizing the communications department. What a joke. What an insult to every American that suffered, that died, that died at the hands of the CDC, the NIH, and all the rest of the smug, arrogant, complacent time servers in the federal medical bureaucracy. They are responsible for the biggest public policy failure in history. Their cure really was worse than the disease, and we'll be paying the price for decades. The science denying lockdowns, an old playbook for a different disease, six feet social distancing, forced masking, all based on the assumption that COVID was spread through droplets when we knew from the start it was mainly spread by tiny aerosols. The madness, the cruelty of school closures when we knew from the start the virus barely affected kids. Fauci, Walensky, Burks, Dr. Death and Destruction, Robert Redfield, all of them. They weren't doing their best with bad information. They had the information, but they did nothing to stop the lockdowns, the school closures, the 
suicides, the domestic violence, the drug and alcohol abuse, the kids' lives ruined. We don't want an apology, Dr. Walensky. We want accountability. Most of all for Fauci and his crimes against society. Fauci, the great champion of gain of function. He pushed through his reckless experiments in Wuhan in direct contravention of Obama and Trump administration rules. It's the most likely origin of the whole thing. And now he's out making jokes about it. Then all set to retire on a fat government pension and cash in with corrupt consultancies with the pharmaceutical industry. No, no, no. Every avenue of accountability must be pursued, legal, criminal, financial. The Republicans promise hearings if they take back the House. Who thinks that's enough? These people should have been fired at the start. If they can be fired now, do it. If their government pensions can be cut, do it. And if they can be put on trial, do that. We must end the culture of impunity in the federal government, from the FBI to the Justice Department to the IRS to the CDC. On and on it goes. Whatever damage you do, whoever you unjustly harass, however much you incompetently waste, however many you callously hurt, if you're in the federal bureaucracy, you just keep on trucking and keep on trucking it up. Decade after decade, the whole gigantic mess just gets bigger, more bloated, more bureaucratic, and as a result, less accountable. We don't even know how many of these swamp agencies there are. A few years ago, the official government source for government agencies literally said there is no authoritative list of government agencies. Of course there isn't. We can't have the American people finding out what's being done in their name with their money. This is why we have so much swampy behavior, the revolving door between big business and big government, shysty lobbyists and swamp monsters like the Podestas, Ricchettis, Biden's Anita Dunn, exploiting public office for personal gain. That's the swamp model. Riches for the insiders, rubbish for the American people. Failure after failure after failure. And that no one is ever fired. They just cling like barnacles on the rotting ship of state. Finally, when the American people put an outsider in power, elected on a promise to drain the swamp, something started to happen. President Trump introduced a vital executive order known as Schedule F. Tens of thousands of federal bureaucrats with influence over policy were reclassified as Schedule F employees, making them easier to fire for poor performance. But this happened right at the end of the administration, after Trump realized the extent of the establishment sabotage, after he realized that this is why nothing ever seems to change, despite the promises politicians make, why everything done by the government just seems to get bigger, more costly, more complicated and bureaucratic, but never actually better. It's because the actual machinery of government, the civil service, is totally broken. In part, that's because the Democrats have politicized the civil service. Just look at their recruiting pool. Since 2000, overall votes in presidential elections nationwide produced roughly a 50-50 split. In Washington, home of the swamp, it's 90% Democrat. If the civil service simply reflects that population, that means more than 9 out of 10 federal bureaucrats are Democrats. In practice, it's likely even more than that, as Democrats and left-leaning people are more likely to want to work in the government in the first place. The swamp propagandists in the media say, that's unfair. Civil servants put their personal political views aside. But even if they do, take it from me as someone who's had to make change happen inside a government machine, civil servants have an establishment mindset, an anti-change mindset. That's why they end up sabotaging a president elected to disrupt the system. And that's why it's so interesting to see that the draining the, the swamp for real this time, using Schedule F again, has been reported as one of the centerpieces of the policy agenda for a Trump second term. And sure enough, straight after that report was published, Democrats introduced legislation to preemptively block Schedule F, protect permanent Washington, and forever insulate the swamp from any attempt at reform. Of course, while well, they dressed it all up as high-minded principle, protecting our democracy, we know the real reason, as with pretty much everything else in the swamp, it's corruption. Oh, look, here's the American Federation of Government Employees, the largest civil service union representing about 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers. Guess where its political donations go? Surprise! Over the last 20 years, 94% to Democrats. We're fighting to drain the swamp. Drain the swamp. Draining the swamp. Drain the swamp. 
Yes, drain the swamp, but do it for real this time. Otherwise, nothing's going to change. When you have people like Fauci causing so much damage and never paying the price, people like Hunter Biden protected by the establishment while working Americans who happen to vote the wrong way feel they'd be persecuted for a parking ticket. All these bureaucrats and all these federal agencies blocking change, hurting you, protecting themselves, hounding you for money, then wasting it on pointless schemes and bureaucratic failure with no accountability ever. This is what they need to know. If you F up, you can F off. That's what I call Schedule F. Fire the civil servants, sell the buildings, starve them of funds, honour the Tenth Amendment. Transfer power over health care, family policy, education, everything not in the Constitution to the states respectively or the people, as the Constitution requires. Close down the unconstitutional federal departments and agencies and bureaucracies with their armies of interferers and armfuls of regulations. Yeah, close it all down. Everything except defense, state, treasury and justice. Abolish the federal income tax. Abolish all federal taxes. Replace them with an annual levy from each state on the basis of population. You think that sounds over the top? No. What's extreme is what we've got now, the insane centralization the Biden regime is engaged in. And unlike their demented centralization, our beautiful decentralization is actually in the Constitution. So let's get off our knees, fight federal overreach, and take back the power that is ours, according to our Constitution. That's the next revolution we need. Tell us if you agree at NextRevFNC and at Steve Hilton X and share this message when we post it. Joining me now for reaction, former legal counsel for the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee and House Oversight Committee and current director of the Oversight Project at the Heritage Foundation, Mike Howe. Mike, um, what do you think? Schedule F, are you a fan? Oh, absolutely. It needs to be a day one priority for the next administration. I think you nailed it in your monologue, but I'd like to add one point. This is about good government and democracy. When the people elect a president to go, go down to D.C., they expect them to have full access to their, their powers and be the chief executive of the executive branch, not to have these permanent bureaucrats making the decision. If you're, if you're in favor of protecting this forever bureaucracy, what you're really in favor of is taking power away from the people to make their own decisions about how their yes. government is run. And I find it highly hypocritical that the left now is saying they're somehow the party of democracy and they just so you know vigorously oppose this. It's a joke. It's a really great point. It's a fundamental point, actually. And if you look through all the policy issues, I can't tell you the number of times when, I mean, I'll give you an example. Just the other day, I was talking to someone about nuclear power, a real expert in nuclear power. Trump administration was in favor of it, wanted to expand it. Uh, this person worked closely uh, and with the Environmental Protection Agency and so on and said, look, what the trouble was, the permanent bureaucrats slow walked everything. And in the end, nothing could happen. And that's why now you've got the Chinese b b getting all the benefit of American companies' technology on nuclear power because the bureaucrats in Washington stopped it from happening. That's just one small example. You've got that right across the government on every policy area. You're absolutely right. And what makes this even more ludicrous is uh, these, you know, political constituency of the left, which are these bureaucrats, brand themselves as public servants. Well, what kind of public servant can't even be fired or thinks they're, they're exactly. above even any accountability for their job? That's not how it works. There is precedent going back to ancient history on this, on this point. Even Aladdin was able to free his genie and it worked out just fine for everyone. They didn't go cry the genie to his unions and lobbyists. This is how being in charge works. And, and exactly as you say, the argument against it is, well, now you're trying to politicize the civil service and, um, you know, have put, instead of these objective kind of servants of the people, you want your political appointees to push politics. But, but hang on a second, that's what an election is, right? It's a choice between two different political agendas and this agenda wins. And so, of course, you need people there to help you implement that. You're absolutely right. And that, that begs the, the next question. We need these people. This is a failure. Uh, part of the Trump administration was getting the right people in the right jobs. And so what we're doing at the Heritage Foundation now is called the 2025 Project. We're looking forward to, you know, day one executive orders and the people to run with them, the different agencies uh, across the government. That's not just political appointees. It's these policy yeah. uh, making positions that Schedule F would apply to. So we need a, a whole of country and not just people with the kind of pedigrees that traditionally go into government, but regular Americans who are sick of 
of what this country and the direction it, it, it's going in. And so uh, we call on everyone across the country. If you want to throw your name in the in the ring, you know, come to D.C. and make a difference because we need tons of patriots and not people just from Washington, D.C. in the swamp to, to keep going in. Yeah, very good point. And qu quickly, Mike. Um, just to be clear, this is not just, and this is the, the, another example of the great change that, that, that Trump has led within the Republican Party. I see that other candidates, potential candidates, obviously none of them declared yet for 2024, are all embracing this. This is not just a Trump thing. This is now a party-wide priority. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really happy to see that, and that's why I don't think these legislative efforts on Capitol Hill are going to go anywhere. I think it's uh, pretty much a well-held view across the party that the bureaucracy and the administrative state are out of control. What we're talking about with Schedule F is really just a few thousand, tens of thousands of people. We need bigger changes than Schedule F, but Schedule F is just the start, uh, and so I'm glad to see everyone's pretty much on board with this. Very good. Well, I'm glad to see that you're working to kind of support the change that everyone will have voted for. Uh, Mike Howe, great to see you. Thank you. All right, let's bring in now Fox News contributor, our friend Tammy Bruce, um, an expert on all the nasty details of swamp behavior and how we might drain it. Um, uh, Tammy, your thoughts? I think it's as exciting looking ahead to kind of the potential change that, that could be brought about. Well, you, your monologue just burned everything down. It was absolutely perfect. <laughs> I, you know, really, this is for the American people. We've gotten into a sense of, well, maybe this swamp is quicksand. Maybe we can't get out. Maybe this is the end of what we just have to do and get what Biden says, which is breathing room so that we can just barely keep our nose above the top of the quicksand. That's not good enough. And, and as Mike noted, that perhaps the, the biggest failure and maybe the only failure of the Trump administration was not recognizing uh, that the government was going to be against him, that the swamp was against him, that these right. bureaucrats were against him. Because in his world and in the world of Americans, in business, everyone must be on board and must want the business to succeed. That is not the case with the American government. So it, it, this has got to be, and I, I'm not quite sure that the Republican Party, in all honesty, is on board with anything. They, they've watched right. this grow yeah. over and over and over in time. And it is Donald Trump and his understanding and experience about what happened that is invaluable right now. And yes, there must be things set up, ready to go on minute one, before minute one, across the, the, the government with demanded resignations, uh, people ready to move in. Because, you know, if you thought the first resistance was exciting, uh, the next one is going to be even more insane, considering the Mar-a-Lago raid. Uh, I think it's really exposed the nature yeah. of how far this government will go. And it's interesting because, as you, as you say that, I can already predict the headlines and the screaming on the on the in the you know, not just the left, you know, the, mo the media, you know, yes. it's all the establishment. It's even the, the left right thing doesn't apply here. This is the establishment, Correct. right? The swap. They look after their own, and they say, "Oh, this is politicization." And what? it is no. I mean, exactly as Mike pointed out, it's such a deep point, which is that these are the people who go on and on about democracy, but when you have someone who comes in who elected to change things, they think it's perfectly okay to block and sabotage at every stage. Well, and we saw that literally at every stage. Even w after the election, uh, as military, some military individuals bragging that they misled the commander-in-chief when he ordered our troops out of Syria, that they said, okay, yeah, sure, and then they never did it. So you're looking at, when you think about uh, you know, democracy, as you discussed, and when you think about uh, fulfilling the orders of the commander in chief, the choice that the individual Americans made to lead this country, and you think it's fine to ignore that and to, in fact, do the opposite uh, most of the time, what does that tell you about the attitude of the swamp, of the bureaucracy, which believes that it is, in fact, the president of the United States, the elected president, is a facade? That's what we're seeing with the Biden administration now. You're yes. seeing the result of the establishment of the bureaucracy running the country. And I would think that there is very little we can point to. There is nothing we can point to that has been good for the country. It has been damaging for the country because there is no center of leadership that is answerable to the American people. And that has got we've got to get that back. Uh, and that's what 24 is going to be all about. Yeah, exactly right. That is such a great point to end it with, Tammy, which is that you see the contrast now. Yeah. This is what it's like when the swamp is in charge, exactly. and that's why they love Biden. Exactly. He's the perfect president for them. Just the, the, the facade. Such a great point. 
Um, there's lots more to discuss on this topic and many others. Tammy, we will see you later on in the show. We'll be right back. You will have noticed that the Biden regime and its media propagandists have been running around pushing a new narrative, or as it's normally described, a lie. As it's most commonly known that despite what you may have thought, this administration is in fact highly competent with an impressive set of policy achievements. Impressive achievements. They have the nerve to say this on the one year anniversary of Biden's Afghanistan disaster when we still have hundreds of Americans and thousands of our allies stranded behind enemy lines in a country that has collapsed into famine and barbarism under the Taliban thanks to Biden's catastrophic surrender. And in a week when the inhumane anti-American chaos of Biden's self-created border crisis and the lies they keep telling us about it were telegraphed to the whole world in this absolutely shocking but actually totally unsurprising video obtained by Fox News showing Biden's federal agents unlocking a gate located on private property in Texas in order to allow migrants to cross into the country. Texas National Guard had stopped them. The Biden regime just said, come on in. Of course they did. They said they wanted a surge at the border, and boy have they got one. Nearly two million arrests this year, all set to shatter their own record last year. Because there really is no limit to their stupidity and the pain they're prepared to inflict on America, just to pander to their activists' far-left zealotry, Biden and the gang are throwing open the southern border at the exact moment a full-blown armed conflict has exploded there between warring drug cartels. This week, employees of the U.S. consulate in Tijuana were told to shelter in place after cartel members began targeting stores, vehicles, even innocent bystanders after local law enforcement tried to arrest gang members. The perfect time to abolish our southern border. Our next guest has been on the ground talking to migrants, border agents and reporting on all of this chaos. Investigative reporter Savannah Hernandez joins us now. Savannah, um, just bring us the latest. What have you been seeing and hearing? Thank you so much for having me on. So what I want to speak about today is the fact that not one but two whistleblowers came forward last week and spoke to me. One of those whistleblowers was an active National Guardsman talking to me about mutilated bodies that the cartel is leaving on the U.S. side of the border as an intimidation tactic, how the cartel is shooting at National Guardsmen and Border Patrol members every single day because they know they can get away with it under Joe Biden's administration. On top of that, we're, of course, continually hearing the stories and the reports and seeing the video imagery of children that have been abandoned at the border. I myself have seen this in Yuma, Arizona, on top of, mm -hmm. you know, at the beginning of the night, 25 illegal immigrants making their way across the border at 12 a.m. By 6 a.m., there were 400 people lined up, many of these people, children, one of them an abandoned child in the desert. So absolutely shocking what we're seeing right now. Um, again, going back to National Guard, they had provided me with a picture. The cartel mm -hmm. had burned this individuals face off with acid left the body on the u.s side of the border for them to find uh, because again the cartel is absolutely emboldened under this administration it's horrifying to see uh, i went to piedras negras as well to speak to the migrants as they made their way to our southern border that's one of the last cities that they enter before crossing into eagle pass texas i was asking them hey where are you headed and uh, do you think that the border is open they were telling me they were going to california of course that they were headed to new york washington dc georgia tennessee they're going yeah. everywhere. And they said, Joe Biden's border is wide open. We think that he's a great man because he's providing us with so much opportunity. And that's why we're making the trek. Uh, the New York Times also just put out a piece regarding the cartels. You know, they were making about $500 million back in 2018. Under Joe Biden's administration, they're making $13 billion. So there's so much going on. Wow. On top of that, my second whistleblower was an employee from MVM Inc. This was the same company that was caught uh, illegally, not illegally because it's legal under the Biden administration but cops yeah. shipping migrants in the middle of the night to New York, right? Those secret night flights. So he actually works as a youth care escort, and he works with kids as young as one month up to 17 years of age, and he basically told me how they're putting 200 to 300 children on these charter flights and shipping them to New York, California, Oregon, Washington, all over the U.S. And so many people keep asking me, isn't this considered child trafficking? Well, yes, it technically would be, but under the Biden administration, this is essentially legal. MVM Inc. signed a federal contract contract with the Biden administration for $136 million back in 2021. So our taxpayer dollars going towards funding all of this. I wrote pieces on the Post Millennial for both of these stories, and I'd highly encourage people to go and read the pieces because, again, yes. uh, on top of these children being shipped throughout the United States, um, 
the employee that spoke to me provided me with an email that was basically stating that these children were being handed over to improperly identified adults, meaning that the paper that the Office of Refugee Resettlement is giving these employees, they're not making sure that the adult on the paper matches I mean, the adult they're handing this child over to, and it's absolutely insane. You know what's incredible about, about, I mean, and I'm sure this is just a kind of small snapshot of everything you've been uncovering. I mean, it's even worse than, than we think. I mean, you know, we've all been watching Bill Malugin's fantastic reporting. I mean, you've, you've gone behind the scenes, you've talked to the agent, you've got these whistleblowers. It's even worse than we thought, and we know it's absolutely catastrophic. What is unbelievable, just final thoughts about it. I mean, what do you make of the Democrat insistence? Still, they insist the border is not open, the border is secure. Mallorcas was saying that just the other day, the other week, and that their policy is humane. Yeah, the Biden administration is an absolute joke and they're liars. I've gone down there myself and any single American can go do this and they can watch illegals flood our border every single day, okay? They're coming across here because they know that America is open for business and this administration can continue to lie to the American people, but we can see what's going on. We can see the demographic of our own country changing in live time and we can see the crime rate surging as the cartel is allowed to run rampant. Well, that's exactly right. And we see, and you mentioned California. I mean, just the scale of the impact, just of one part of this, the fentanyl on, ki on kids and families in California, never mind the rest of the country, is just absolutely uh, shocking. And it just gets worse and worse. Um, thank you, Savannah, for, your, for being with us tonight, but also for your reporting. You know, I, I know you'll keep it up, and hopefully we'll see you again, um, because this isn't going to change as long as this administration uh, doesn't change. Great to see you. Thank you. Stay with us. Much more up ahead. So it seems as if the left are doing everything they possibly can to discredit the cause of environmentalism, which, as you know, is something I care about a lot, as long as we approach it in a positive and practical way with common sense solutions, not crazed alarmism and extremist climate zealotry. Instead, we have yet another installment of celebrity climate hypocrisy. Leonardo DiCaprio again, funding climate lawsuits one day, jetting off on his gas-guzzling private plane and yacht the next. And then this ludicrous piece of propaganda claiming that climate change is making children obese. With all this madness, what hope is there for sensible environmental action? Well, he's here right now. Our friend Benji Backer, founder of the American Cons Conservation Coalition, which has just launched a new platform for conservatives who care about all this, the climate commitment. Um, Benji, I sometimes think that the people who sort of shout the loudest about climate are the ones doing the most to damage the cause. Well, Steve, you're exactly right. People like Leonardo DiCaprio, it's not that flying around on a jet is the problem. It's that they advocate for policies that are unrealistic and that would actually hurt everyone but them. And that's actually conservatives' time. To, it's an example of where conservatives need to come to the table and say, actually, we don't want that sort of policy to ban fossil fuels or to say that we need to get over uh, fossil fuels overnight, but to propose our own alternatives. And that's what we've done with the climate commitment commitment, which is the first ever pro-climate and pro-American alternative to what we're seeing from the far left. And what are some of the examples? Because I know that, you know, that for some people, the minute that you even you, you got so politicized, the minute you even say the word climate, people's kind of mm. hackles go up and say, I don't want anything to do with that. Well, look, at the end of the day, climate change isn't about some sort of global issue that is so political. It's about our own backyards. Each one of us has environmental concerns that we care about that are local to us or things that we've experienced throughout our lives. The climate commitment talks about that and goes through an approach, a six-pillared approach, that talks about how we can apply those pillars to every single environmental issue that we're seeing across the world. And we're seeing those changes. Everyone in this country, everyone in the, across the world is seeing these changes, but we also know that that there are different solutions to different problems. A solution that works in Washington state does not work in Louisiana. And yet the left has been putting together these proposals that are one size fits all solutions, banning certain things, uh, only doing 100% of certain things. We know that's not realistic. And the environmental conversation needs to go back to our backyards and put the environment back into environmentalism like it was supposed to be. 
But if you look at some of the things that we hear about the whole time that just infuriates, there's only someone like me, and I, I would say, as I said, I'm an environmentalist. I, I, I care deeply about this. But things like sort of banning gas cookers, right? It's, it's, it's now re it really has become a mainstream policy for the left, right? You, you see it in city after city, town, you know, counties banning you know, new, new buildings aren't allowed to have gas powered, you know, gas, gas heating, heating and cooking. And it's just ridiculous. That's not going to make any difference to anything. Except annoy well, people. it doesn't. It doesn't. And, and natural gas is a clean alternative to coal. We're seeing emissions drop in the United States more than any other country combined because of natural gas. But look, Steve, at the end of the day, the problem is that unlike you know, your show, most of, uh, you know, most of Fox News is, is like looking at how we can put this criticism of, of the climate dialogue and the conservative movement talking about the criticism of the climate dialogue. And if all we do is criticize and we don't come up with an alternative and talk about pro-environmental reforms like you do and like our organization does, we're going to keep losing. And when we don't have our voice at the table, we just lose. We need to come to the table with our own good ideas that combat the craziness and don't just go to the other side, which is this denial that's been so pervasive. Yes. Let's come to the table with our own good ideas. You've been helpful in that. We just have to keep pushing for that. I agree with you. But I mean, by the way, I, the, the, the reason I think that that happens, that you got that dynamic, is because of this incredible zenitry that actually, if you even challenge, you, I mean, they, they, you can't have a sensible conversation with the left either, right? If you challenge the specifics of their plans, they immediately, oh, you're a climate denier. No, I'm not. I just don't think it's a good idea to hurt working Americans and their families without any actual benefit to the climate. And all it does is help you, your donors in the green lobby. I mean, that's what that's the problem that they they're, they're not sensible about it. That's why it's really hard. That's why, by the way, I really admire what you're doing because you're putting forward kind of practical, common sense solutions. Great example that you embrace nuclear power, which the left won't hear about, even though it's carbon free and reliable. You know, we, we haven't got time to go into all the details. But I agree with you, we need to have a positive conversation. But I also would say we need to call them out for their zealotry because. Um, otherwise, you know, the extremes just take over. And as with so many other things, you know, it's the kind of sensible kind of majority that usually have the right answers. Anyway, Benji, we have to leave it there for now. Great to see you. We'll be back after this short break. What is it with these far left extremists who seem to have taken over the Democratic Party and much of the media? They just can't leave anything alone. Everything has to be political. Everyone has to fall in line with their ideological zealotry. Latest example, now they're saying that the rosary is a symbol of violent right-wing extremism. Why do they hate religion so much? Why do they hate Catholics? No wonder that between 2012 and 2020, Democrat support among Latinos went down by eight points and Republican support went up by eight points. Are the left trying to drive everyone away except the rich, white and woke? Here to help break it down is former Democratic Majority Leader of the California State Senate, Gloria Romero. Gloria, I mean, we just keep seeing these examples of this. I mean, it's like they're, they're deliberately trying to drive Latinos away. I mean, I, I don't know. What's going on here? Holy Mother of God, Steve. I mean, first, they came after our parents standing up at school board meetings, and now it seems they're going to go after our abuelitas, our grandmothers, for saying the rosary. It's absolutely incredulous, but you've exactly nailed it. This is how, not surprisingly, especially woke Democratic Party leaders are losing the Latino community. And do they realize that? Um, but they can't do anything about it because they're, they, they just, they, the activists control them. Or do they not even, are they not even aware and they're just going to keep doing more of this? I think this is embedded in where this woke ideology is going. Make no doubt about it, this is very much a war on religion. It's a war on Christians. It's a war on Catholicism especially. And I would ask, I would ask, where is Joe Biden? I mean, I am old enough to remember when JFK was running and there was a lot of question about him running as a Catholic. Mm. Uh, this very much fits into a narrative of the Democratic Party in terms of questioning anybody who might have a contrary view, whether it might be on abortion rights, on basically issues of looking at transgenderism. So make no doubt, as funny as we sort of joke about this, like, are, is 
this really true? Is this not out of the Babylon right. Bee? But it really is a concerted effort to further demine and to define anybody who won't tow the woke yes. party line to basically call us as extremists. The interesting thing is, Steve, is I work as a senator. I oversaw prisons and jails in California. The rosary is something that is universally recognized as a symbol of faith, of redemption, of, of basically belonging, of hope. And so many times I would find the rosary in the chapels, in the cells, whether they were the inmates, oh, we're not supposed to say that anymore, the incarcerated persons, <laughs> That's right. gang members, as, as well as my abuelitas. So the rosary is something, it is not extremist, but it is a way that increasingly Sadly, the Atlantic and others are pushing this woke ideology to try to call us as Christian extremists and by going after a symbol that has been universally revered for centuries. Yeah, I mean, it's really come to something when they think that calling you religious, uh, calling you a Christian is an insult. But that's where we are. Gloria, thank you so much. You laid it out beautifully tonight. Um, we'll be back after this short break. All right, let's bring in this week's closer. Yes, of course, it's Tammy. She is back with us now. White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain was out this week bragging about the triumphs of the Biden administration. The quote that got all the attention was him saying that unlike Trump, Biden isn't creating a bleep storm every day. But perhaps the most ridiculous Klain claim was that Biden isn't, quote, getting in the middle of culture wars. Yeah, of course, we all remember how Biden stayed out of culture wars by, you know, on day one of his presidency, destroying girls' sports via executive order or calling anyone who disagrees with him a Jim Crow supporting racist or setting his Justice Department onto parents who want to stop the woke indoctrination of their children by the teacher unions who corruptly fund Biden's campaigns. Yeah, that's Joe Biden for you. Definitely staying out of culture wars. Tammy, your thoughts on Biden staying out of culture wars? Well, I really appreciate you doing this and asking me, because this is very important. <laughs> exactly. This reveals that the left, and that means today's Democratic Party, does not see any other agenda or narrative or culture other than their own. No one else exists. That for them, there was a culture war when their favorite topics were uh, being debated or under attack or that there might be some change. In this case, Americans must hear this, no matter what party they belong to or, or, or what they believe in, is that this is, and I think Klain really genuinely believes this, that no yes. one else exists, that no other issues matter, that no matter what we think about the school boards or the schools or a woke ideology or, or getting rid of uh, Lincoln and Jefferson and Washington, or caring about the nature of parents being in charge of their children, all of those things are irrelevant to them. And that comment reveals that. This it is does. not like they're struggling every day about how to find a balance. No one else exists. And that's the problem with this big government. Everyone yeah. is, a, is a, a tag on a piece of paper. We are, we're little pieces of, we're like hashtags. We don't, we don't exist as human beings. That's what allows nationalized health care to happen. That's what allows you to uh, criminalize parents who go to a school board because it's all about what's on the paper. It's all about protecting yourself. No one else exists. And that, of course, if this, if this continues, we've seen historically what, the, what happens to nations when leadership believes that, the, that human beings do not matter and that no one else matters but them. Uh, and you know, the good news is the founders anticipated this, and that's why the Constitution exists. Exactly. And now we've inherited the responsibility. They've given us the, the template of what to do, and now we get to do it. And it should be an honor, and we should be happy about it, and we should be confident, and that's what's going to get us through this. Very good. You see, it's so interesting, Tammy, because um, that's why you're so brilliant, because, you know, at the end of the show, you know, I, we do these pieces and you think, yeah, it's a bit of fun, like ridiculous, you know, a bit of political stuff. Hypocrisy, he says, well, is clearly not true, but it's much, much deeper than that. It actually, is. Actually, and that's what you've shown. There's something deep here that when they engage in these policy interventions, 
pushing this far left woke agenda, they don't even think of it as culture wars because exactly. they think theirs is the only culture that matters. That that's it, and they as a result, they're not even thinking about what it means to the people who are frightened or the people who are disappeared or erased or who lose their jobs or what happens when they, because you know we're in this painful transition and we just need breathing room. We're, we're like little bugs on the surface of yes. a ball and they don't, they genuinely don't care. And that's what's stunning. And so this is not about struggles that they're going through or that they mean well. Having come from the left, the left does not mean well. They are on a rampage and they mean to uh, destroy everything that in fact might just be irritating to them, but it must happen because there can be nothing else that matters. And that's yes. the state we're in right now. Don't let any of your viewers think or fall for this argument that they're the bad guys, that speaking yeah. up is wrong, that challenging the ethics of the FBI or the DOJ or the IRS is, makes you an extremist. It does not. All of those things yes. are lies. Well, you're and right. Look forward. I'm well said, Tammy. Got to leave it there. What a way to end it. Thank you so much. Make sure you join us next Sunday when the next revolution will be televised.